Hi everybody and welcome to unfortunately the last talk of this series. Uh, we are already busy planning the next instantiation slash versions of it, um, but before introducing today's speakers, I want to kind of take a second and thank the many people who made all of this possible. Um, rest assured, this was not a small task. The series was uh, created at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, just as everybody uh, was scrambling to kind of move in-person events uh, to live uh, or streaming uh, events. I think ICLR was the first one I can remember doing so. I think probably there were others before. Um, it took an enormous amount of effort to kind of make this happen smoothly uh, as the logistics of a widely attended live virtual event, as you can imagine, are non-trivial. Um, so I think you've been seeing me pretty regularly every month, uh, but there is actually a huge list of people, or some of whom are now in a in a kind of green room, so to speak, in in, in the back, uh, who actually made this happen. So uh, I want to thank, first of all, my co-organizers, uh, Phil Rosenfield and Brittany Muller, uh, our digital engagement team, Jessica Mastronardi, Tara Grum, Alisa Hughes, Erica Laxon, Matthew Sanderson, and last but not least, our production team who kept basically the stream from from going from collapsing and saved the the day in multiple occasions. So it would be Sean Witzel, William Batts, Will Morrill, and Matt McGinley. Um, so I want to extend huge thanks uh, to all of them, and also thank you to our speakers for uh, the many incredible talks and engagement. And by the way, all the talks are available on YouTube, including today's talk in, in a little bit. So, and now uh, for today's talk, I'm extremely happy to introduce Madeleine Dudel, who's an assistant professor of operations research and information engineering and the Richard and Sibyl Smith Sesquicentennial Fellow at Cornell University. She studies optimization and machine learning for large scale data analysis and control with applications in marketing, demographic modeling, medical informatics, engineering system design, and automated machine learning. Her research in optimization centers on detecting and exploiting novel structure in optimization problems with a particular focus on convex and low rank problems. These structures lead the way to automatic proofs of optimality, better complexity guarantees, and faster, more memory efficient algorithms. She has developed a number of open source libraries for modeling and solving optimization problems, including convex.jl, which is one of the top tools in the Julia language for technical computing. Today, she's going to talk about structure models for automated machine learning. So without further ado, let's hear the talk and thank you. Hi, my name is Madeline Udell. It's a pleasure to be here today virtually at Microsoft Research to tell you about structural models for automated machine learning. This talk is based on joint work uh, led by my PhD student, Chengren Yang, along with a bunch of other collaborators from Cornell. But first, let me talk about why you would be interested in doing automated machine learning. Okay. The fundamental insight is that different data sets require different machine learning models. Now, this is a classic example of um, three different data sets um, that's uh, uh, presented on scikit-learn. And you can see the three different shapes of the data set. The first one is the half moon data set where two half moons are interleaved. Another one has a, um, a circle of red uh, points around a, a circle of blue points of the second class. And the other is two classes that are um, linearly separable or nearly linearly separable. Okay. And you can see that you know there are a bunch of different models in scikit-learn, and they do differently well on these different data sets. Okay. Of course, you don't want to have to try out all the models on all of the data sets yourself. That takes a very long time. It takes a lot of compute, and it takes a lot of uh, programmer effort coding this. Okay. So you'd rather have a system that chooses the best model for you automatically. Okay. So what are all the decisions that you need to make in choosing a machine learning model? Um, if you're thinking about uh, machine learning models, uh, you know, in, in some like the scikit-learn paradigm, which is what we'll be doing for at least the first um, portion of this talk, um, a machine learning model, you can think of as a pipeline of decisions that you have to make. Uh, maybe the first step would be to impute uh, missing data or to decide how to impute missing data, if any exists. Another step would be to decide how to encode uh, categorical values um, or possibly ordinal values. A uh, third step would be to standardize your data. Um, for example, you could uh, demean and divide by the variance. Um, a third step might be feature selection. Um, so in this example, perhaps we're using PCA and selecting 25% of the PCA components as new features for our data set. And the last step is to choose an estimator. Um, and this is 
usually the step that people concentrate most on in automated machine learning. In some cases, um, you'll, you'll see automated machine learning that only looks at choosing an estimator. And the estimator generally comes with parameters. For example, if you're using k nearest neighbors, you would need to choose the number of nearest neighbors. Okay, so this is a lot of different choices to make um, uh, uh, in, in, in building a machine learning model. And that means that you generally don't have um, enough uh, time or patience or compute to try them all. Okay, um, so you might think, well, uh, you know, can't I just, you know, can't I just pick the best pipeline, the one that just works best on average across all data sets? Okay, so we actually tried doing this experiment. Um, we took uh, 215 mid-size uh, data sets uh, from OpenML that were all classification data sets, and we computed, uh, well, we, we ran um, exhaustively every pipeline that finished under a certain time budget on all of these data sets, and we selected the pipeline that was best on average. Um, so this is actually kind of cool. I can tell you what that pipeline is. What is the best on average pipeline if you can only you know, try one on your new data set? Um, and the answer is you should impute the missing entries by the mode. You should encode categoricals as integers. Um, you should uh, standardize the data. Um, you should remove features with zero variance. And uh, for the estimator, you ought to use a gradient boosting estimator with a learning rate of 0.25 and a maximum depth of three. Okay. So that's the best on average pipeline, um, and we'll occasionally refer to that as the, the, the baseline pipeline. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if you wanted to pick the best pipeline for each model, you would find that the best pipeline for each model differs substantially from this baseline pipeline. So gradient boosting, um, you know, it is the best estimator on 38% of data sets, but that means on most data sets, it is not the best estimator. Um, we also find the multi-layer perceptron works well on a lot of data sets. K nearest neighbors is very good for low dimensional data sets. Um, add a boost, extra trees, logistic regression. Okay, so, so actually we have representation from a very large number of estimators, right? And this is only just considering um, which estimator you're using, not any of the other hyperparameters and not any of the other components of the pipeline. Okay, so, um, you know, the goal of autom automated machine learning is to be able to, okay, pick, pick a better pipeline on each data set than just the baseline pipeline. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, there's theory to back this up, right? That there's no one model that works best for every problem. Uh, okay, so let's let's introduce some definitions. What is automated machine learning? It's a it's a method to choose a machine learning model uh, and hyperparameters so that you don't have to. So, what are the types of automated machine learning? Hyperparameter tuning um, just chooses the best hyperparameters for the model. So you're fixing the type of component for each you know component of the of the pipeline and you're just choosing hyperparameters, like the number of neighbors and nearest neighbors, or the depth of a decision tree, or the learning rate. Okay, a uh, second kind of automated machine learning is combined algorithm and hyperparameter search, which is choosing an estimator and hyperparameters for that estimator. Okay, um, a third kind of automated machine learning is neural architecture search. Okay, so this is, you know, restricting uh, uh, to just deep neural nets, um, what kind of architecture should you use for a given problem? Okay, so you might think about choosing the number of layers, the type of layer, the width of the layers, the learning rate. Okay, this is its own field, and I'm not going to talk almost at all about it. Okay, um, and a fourth kind of automated machine learning is meta-learning, learning to learn. So here, we're not just learning from what we can glean from this data set, but we're actually trying to generalize from a corpus of tasks to a new task, right? So you might collect a bunch of data sets, see what works the best on all of those data sets and use that to figure out more efficiently what works on your last data set. So in this talk, I'm gonna argue that um, rather structured models for meta-learning um, can perform among the best uh, uh, possible for automated machine learning. Um, there are also lots of kinds of data sets and different kinds of auto ML are going to be appropriate for each of these. I'm going to concentrate um, almost uh, uh, in the in the first uh, uh, two component parts of the talk on tabular data. Okay, and we'll be using sort of base models that come from scikit-learn. Okay, so what kinds of techniques? Uh, are used for automated machine learning. Um, in some ways, I, I feel that uh, automated machine learning is a microcosm of all of machine learning. And part of what I love about studying it is that you see a tremendous variety of methods used for automated machine learning, um, uh, uh, you know, in, inside this method, which, which have sort of different views of what the fundamental problems or even what the shape of these hyperparameter landscapes um, looks like. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, 
uh, a couple of these that are important for um, the remainder of, of, of my talk and to understand the, um, the low rank AutoML uh, methods that I'm going to show to you. Okay. Maybe the, the, the most basic idea in automated machine learning is that you can do something better than grid search. Okay, grid search is probably the first method that anyone thinks about when they think about choosing a hyperparameter. Um, and uh, you know, so what do you do? You pick a max and a min value for each hyperparameter, and you grid out the possible values in there. Um, uh, there's an observation that's due to Bergstra and Bengio um, that uh, if you, instead of using a grid, you pick a max and a min value, and you pick random points between those max and min values for each of the parameters, you can actually do better than grid search, okay? And the reason why random search tends to do better than grid search um, is because uh, you might have one parameter, um, here the green parameter, that's much more important than the yellow parameter, okay? So um, if the effect of uh, each of these parameters is additive, you can see that choosing the yellow parameter correctly matters much less than choosing the green parameter correctly. Okay, so if we're doing grid search, we're only sampling three distinct values of the green parameter and we miss the peak. But if we're using random search, we actually sample nine distinct values of the, the green curve and we can find a point that's much closer to the peak. Um, Bayesian optimization um, is a more sophisticated framework for choosing uh, uh, in mostly scalar hyperparameters. Um, and uh, you can also use it for integer hyperparameters. Um, the, the idea of Bayesian optimization is you say, I have a couple of observations right, from, my, um, from my objective function. Right? I've evaluated, um, uh, I've, I've maybe evaluated my model, fixing the hyperparameters at you know, this value um, and also at this value. Okay? And I'm going to assume that the, um, I'm going to assume a, a prior distribution over hyperparameter landscapes that is um, drawn from a Gaussian process. Okay? And if I make that assumption, then the posterior distribution is also a Gaussian process. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and that means that it's very easy to compute things about this, about this distribution. In particular, I could do things like compute the mean plus the variance. Okay? And that can actually tell me which point um, which point balances um, the likelihood of um, sort of the, right, the, uh, getting a, a, a good new value um, with the chance to explore, um, right? So I, I might want to sample points that I'm rather uncertain about, but also points that I expect to have pretty high values. Okay, so one simple way of doing this is to say form a, a function that's the mean plus the variance, uh, mean or mean plus standard deviation of your um, posterior distribution and sample at the point that maximizes that posterior. Um, okay, the main assumption, so this is a, a super, super, super uh, uh, popular method for uh, automated machine learning. Um, and there, there's, there's a ton of papers, um, which I'm not gonna go into in detail, lots of different ways of sort of computing best sampling distributions or using extra information um, to accelerate uh, uh, Bayesian optimization. But the fundamental insight here is that, is that Bayesian optimization is, is, is assuming a smooth hyperparameter landscape. It's assuming that you know, nearby values should have you know, rather similar values. And uh, there are many different kernels you can use for Bayesian optimization, but um, nevertheless, like uh, uh, locality matters. Okay. Um, on the other hand, you might think about you know, some kinds of hyperparameters, like consider um, learning rates, even for convex optimization. Okay. So you know that, so if we fix the maximum number of iterations, right? If the learning rate is such that your algorithm can converge, then it converges down to the same value regardless. If the learning rate is such that the algorithm can't quite converge, right? Then as the learning rate gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you'll be a little bit farther away from the optimum. So, so actually there's some kink somewhere and you end up with a piecewise linear function there. And if the learning rate is too large and there's a sharp threshold, you're gonna diverge, okay? in which case you're gonna to jump to a much worse value. Okay, so in this case, you're saying a, a, an example of a hyperparameter landscape that we do not expect to be smooth, okay? So it's not clear that Bayesian optimization would be a great choice, but more generally, um, it can be problematic. It doesn't explain how to deal with high dimensional hyperparameter landscapes, um, and it doesn't explain how to uh, deal with discrete uh, hyperparameter choices. 
Um, so there, there are other methods to solve these problems, notably genetic programming. Um, and uh, the teapot, a teapot method is probably the best known example of this. Um, but I'm going to tell you about a, a way to do this using meta learning. And I think that this method draws more on what humans do to learn um, and to, to learn to, to, to choose machine learning models, right? You've tried a bunch of machine learning models on a bunch of different data sets um, over the course of your life. And you've grown to know, you know, which kinds of models tend to work better for which kinds of data sets and which ranges of hyperparameters tend to work well for which data sets. Okay, so um, we're gonna we're gonna generalize from 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 this idea, and we're gonna try to um, systematize this idea. So so that's that's meta learning, right? So meta learning says you know the normal learning, right? You take a data set, you split the samples into training samples, validation samples, and test samples. In meta learning, we're gonna take a set of data sets. So imagine every column here is a is a data set, okay? And we're gonna consider a set of training data sets, a set of validation data sets, and a set of test data sets, okay? Um, we are going to um, train our um, meta learning model on a set of training data sets. We can choose hyperparameters of our meta learning model on a meta validation set. Um, and we can test how well our uh, meta learning model performs on a meta test set of data sets. Okay. Uh, the, the real promise of meta learning is, is the idea that you could pick a model on a new data set without using any expensive function evaluations. Right, you've learned to generalize on a new data set. Um, and, and, and really the key question is, what kinds of features do you need to compute on this new data set in order to be able to make a prediction of what automated machine le mo learning model, oh sorry, what machine learning model is gonna perform the best? Okay, so how do you featureize a data set? Okay, so um, here's one example of how you might featureize a data set. Um, this is the set of uh, meta features that was proposed by um, Auto Scikit Learn. Um, which is uh, uh, one of the sort of the, the earliest um, um, good automated machine learning toolboxes for scikit-learn. Um, and so you can see what they use, right? They, they use the number of instances in the data set and the log number of instances, the number of classes, number of features, log number of features, and then some things that are a little bit uh, uh, kind of more like algorithms than they are like features of the data set. Um, so for example, you can run a decision tree or a decision learner or one nearest neighbors um, or uh, PCA. Um, and you can look at sort of simple statistics of these very simple algorithms and use them as uh, meta features for the model, right? So you might imagine it's important to know about your data set, whether, you know, forests kind of work better or uh, uh, nearest neighbors models kind of work better or linear models are likely to work better. Okay. Um, the, the downside is you have to explicitly design such a feature set. Uh, and you'd need to compute all of these things before you can make any guess, right? It also means, you know, this is the downside of all feature engineering, um, is that you can't learn more and more and more about your data set if you have uh, more time or more resources. Okay, um, but let me describe for you a simple um, uh, meta-learning system that uses these features, and that's auto sklearn. Okay, so, um, and this is a, 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 you know, this is, the real system is a little bit more complicated than this, okay? This is a cartoon. Um, so offline, for all meta training data sets, you're going to compute the uh, data set meta features and use Bayesian optimization to find the best model and its hyperparameters for each of those training data sets. Okay, now online, when a new test data set arrives that you want to predict really quickly on, what you're going to do is compute the data set meta features for that test data set and you're going to consider the best model and hyperparameters for the k most similar data sets. Remember, you've pre-computed those, okay? Now, optimally, you'll tune the hyperparameters further with Bayesian optimization. And finally, you'll form an ensemble out of those models. So you'll average the predictions of all of these nearest neighbor models, okay? Um, in a picture, this is what it looks like, okay? So imagine each of these blue dots is a training data set, and the space that I'm living in is the meta feature space. Okay, so it's not two dimensional, it's higher dimensional. Okay, now I'm, when a new test data set arrives, I'm gonna compute its meta features and that allows me to place it in this, uh, uh, in this feature space. And I'm gonna compute its nearest neighbors. So here's nearest neighbor one, nearest neighbor two, and nearest neighbor three. For each of these nearest neighbors, I have previously um, computed the best um, machine learning model um, and I've used Bayesian optimization in order to tune its hyperparameters. So for nearest neighbor one, I think it has uh, a best hyperparameter at lambda one star. Nearest neighbor two, I think lambda two star is the best. And nearest neighbor three, I think lambda three star is the best. Okay. 
um, now for uh, for my um, uh, for my new data set. I'm going to evaluate the model at lambda one star, lambda two star, and lambda three star. Um, and then I'm going to, you know, if I have extra time, I'll run a couple of extra iterations of Bayesian optimization in order to refine which um, which point I think uh, is actually best for this new data set. Okay. Um, and I might do this for each, right? If, if various of the nearest neighbors have different estimators that they think are the best, I might do this separately for each estimator who is, is the best and un ensemble the results of those estimators. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, so our work, um, you know, we sort of started at this point, um, and we said, well, you know, it's kind of unpleasant that you have to do this feature engineering, right? Is there a way to do meta learning without feature engineering and to find somehow the best features to explain performance on a given task? Okay, so our thesis, um, you know, the thesis of, of, of uh, this paper Oboe and its follow-up Tensor Oboe is that you can and should do meta-learning from the task itself. You can run experiments on other data sets and other fast-to-train models, um, and you can use low-rank structure to meta-learn. Okay. Um, in, in, in simultaneous work, uh, uh, Nicola Fusi and collaborators at Microsoft Research also developed a uh, meta-learning model um, using low-rank structure called probabilistic matrix factorization. Um, it draws on a lot of the same ideas. Okay, but let me explain to you how OBO works. Um, given M data sets and N machine learning models, Okay, so we're in the meta-learning setting. We start with a collection of data sets, and we're going to do something really expect expensive on this collection of data sets so that when a new data set comes, we can learn efficiently from it. Okay, and think of these end machine learning models, by the way, think of them as uh, machine learning models together with hyperparameters. Okay, we're going to measure the error of every model on every data set. And we're going to use that to form an M by N data table, which I'm going to call A. Okay, so there's one row for every data set. There's one column for every model. And the entries are the error of that model on that data set. Now, here's the, the low rank step. I am going to factor this matrix. Okay, maybe I'll use PCA, right, or the top KSVD to find a K dimensional vector X for every row for every data set and a K dimensional vector Y for every column, right? That means for every uh, machine learning model. Okay, now suppose a new data set comes along. Okay, that's a new row of this uh, data table A, which I'm, I'm going to call the, the error matrix. Okay, that corresponds to a new row of this uh, matrix X, right? So it's a new K dimensional vector. And if I knew that K dimensional vector, I could just multiply it by the matrix Y, which has the representations for each model, in order to figure out how well every model would perform on my new data set. Okay, that's pretty powerful. Okay, so how do I estimate this low dimensional vector? So the way that I'm gonna suggest to do it is I'm gonna run a couple of models on my new data set. And I'm going to use least squares to estimate the vector x that when multiplied by y, right, by the uh, corresponding columns of y, gives me the errors that I actually saw or approximates them as well as possible. So that's just a linear regression problem. It's really easy. Okay, now I have an estimate for my new um, row of x data set meta features. Um, and I can use that to estimate the performance of every other model in the data set and choose the models that I think will perform the best. Okay, so I'm going to think of the rows of X as the data set meta features, the columns of Y as the model meta features, and notice that the inner product between a given row of X and a column of Y tells me the predicted model performance of that model on that data set. Okay, so I'm actually, I'm actually predict in this feature space, okay, in this meta feature space. I can predict model performance as a linear function, okay? which is uh, the nice thing about that is it's really simple and it enables me to compute things like the value of information. Okay, so um, one question you might ask at this point is, is automated machine learning really low rank? Um, is this an appropriate model for this, uh, for this problem? Um, and so uh, you can, uh, you might, might understand this just by taking that error matrix and looking at its spectrum, okay? So um, how, how many, uh, uh, how large a rank do you need to capture a certain amount of energy from this matrix? And in fact, as you increase the rank on this um, x-axis, 
you can see that the singular values go down quite rapidly. Okay, so even though it's true that the you know this matrix is not exactly low rank, the singular values do not go to zero, you know, by any means. Okay, um, nevertheless, the first couple of singular values capture by far the majority of the energy in this matrix. Okay, so you sh should expect to get a pretty good approximation with a uh, a small dimension k. Okay. On the other hand, you can see that there's a trade-off. The model should improve with higher rank. On the other hand, to estimate a higher rank model, you would need to increase the number of experiments. The number of experiments that you run needs to be at least as high as the dimension of the vector you're going to estimate. Okay. So our approach is to start with a really small rank and then increase the rank one by one, performing new experiments, re-estimating the higher dimensional vector um, x until you run out of time. Okay, but this is nice because it gives you a way to create fast models and then to refine them sort of arbitrarily well um, until you run out of time. Okay, um, it's also worth noting that that you know you maybe could have predicted um, this behavior because in fact most squarish beta matrices are approximately low rank. So um, and that's a result uh, uh, by a paper uh, by me and Alex Townsend a couple of years ago. Okay, so. But one of the nicest things about these low rank models is it allows you to estimate the value of information. So suppose I want to find this unknown vector X, the data set meta features for a new data set. Um, the way I can do this is pick a set of measurements Y, right? So that corresponds to which machine learning models am I using? Okay, I'm going to say that I'm using the set of uh, uh, columns corresponding to indices in S. Okay, and the measurements I'm going to make are of the form X transpose Y. And then I'm going to say uh, plus epsilon. So this epsilon is really accounting for deviations for the low rank model. Now, of course, it's not true that deviations from the low rank model are Gaussian. But if I assume that they're Gaussian, I can get a really nice result that tells me how to pick the columns. OK, so let's just uh, go with this assumption for now. Now, um, given these measurements, I can estimate x using least squares. Okay, And based on these assumptions, um, I can compute the expectation and the variance of my estimator for x. OK, so under this Gaussian error assumption, the mean of my estimator is actually correct, right? It's equal to x. And the variance of the estimator is given by um, the sum of yy transpose quantity inverse. OK, so this kind of makes sense. You should think about each of these um, uh, model meta features, the y's, as being a vector in some high dimensional space. And if I want to get information about an unknown vector x, I don't know where it could be. I would like to sample vectors that span the full space. And preferably, I want to sample vectors that are as uh, linear, right, that are as, uh, 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 you know, as linearly independent as possible, right? So I want them to, um, uh, to be well conditioned, OK? And that's exactly what this is measuring. Um, one sanity check is that if you had some direction in which you had no component of, of any, of any uh, vector y, um, you would have unbounded variance in that direction. So um, our goal is to um, you know, minimize the uncertainty of this estimator while, while still getting a good um, estimate and expectation. So we're going to minimize some scalarization of the variance of our estimator. Um, and a pretty popular scalarization is the log determinant. And that's what we'll use. OK, so um, if we want to write this down as an optimization problem, I'm going to indicate, uh, introduce an indicator vector um, v. So it has one entry that's 0 or 1. It's 1 if I um, measure uh, model uh, uh, with model j, and it's a 0 otherwise. Um, in this case, the, um, uh, the predicted variance of my estimator is, um, is this, uh, the inverse of this quantity in, in parentheses. Um, so I'm, I'm going to minimize the uh, log determinant of the, uh, of the variance. And I'm going to add a constraint. And actually, the nice thing about this optimization framework is it allows me to add you know, any constraint that's easily expressible in this way. And the constraint that I'm going to add is that the um, sum of the models that I choose times the time that I estimate it's going to take them to run is less than or equal to my runtime budget. Okay. So that means I'm going to choose a set of optimally well-conditioned measurements to take uh, that still are estimated to run in the allowed time. Okay, so to solve this problem, unfortunately, this is a this is a uh, 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 this is a, well certainly combinatorially hard. Okay, it's actually an SDP with uh, binary constraints. This is not easy. 
Okay. Um, but there are two uh, decent approaches. One is to relax it to a semi-definite program. Um, so you relax this constraint and you round the solution. And the second approach is to use a greedy algorithm. So we greedily add um, uh, models to test um, one by one um, and use the fact that the submodularity of the objective guarantees good performance for this greedy algorithm. Uh, maybe the most uh, uh, surprising part about this is uh, uh, is the fact that you can use um, you can actually estimate how long it's going to take each model to run on each data set pretty well. Okay, so um, you know in our experiments we ran a bunch of different models on a bunch of different data sets uh, with a bunch of different hyperparameters, and we created a model to predict how long it would take each of these. Um, each of these methods to run on our data set. And what's interesting is that, that you could do this with a, a very simple model. So our model used the number of uh, data points, the number of features, and the log of the number of data points. And we looked at um, uh, polynomial models um, in those features of order up to three. Okay, so just polynomial regression. Um, and this model fit pretty well. So it predicted um, how long it would take um, uh, one of these methods to run within a factor of two for more than 90% of the data sets. Okay, so these black lines are showing when I've correctly predicted the runtime within a factor of two. You can see that most points fall inside here. Um, one sort of interesting feature is that the points that are most likely to fall outside of these lines, the points where we predict the least well, those are the linear models or the uh, the models that are based on linear models, right? And essentially, this is because the other ingredient that you need to estimate the complexity of a linear model is the condition number of the feature matrix, and estimating the condition number is not fast. Okay. So, how well does this uh, work as a system for for automated machine learning? Um, so, I. Uh, here we've we, so so these plots compare obo to um, uh, uh, the state of the art method at the time auto scikit learn um, and also to a random baseline the random baseline is not it's not you know completely random because what we did is we chose uh, random models that were estimated to run um, within the time budget um, and used those uh, in order to estimate this low uh, low dimensional vector okay so it's like obo except instead of using experiment design to select which models to run. We're just using random models estimated to run fast enough. Okay. Um, so you can see that the sort of OBO family of models is performing um, at, at least competitively with auto scikit learn. Um, and at short times, um, it's doing substantially better because it returns an answer faster. It doesn't need to evaluate all of the data set meta features before it can make a recommendation. Um, you can also see that um, our method that uses experiment design is doing slightly better than the random method that chooses a random um, uh, uh, model that's uh, predicted to run fast enough. Okay, so this experiment design method does seem to have a positive effect. Okay, and this is true both on um, the collection of data sets on OpenML and also the collection of data sets in UCI. Okay, so. Um, that works pretty well for uh, uh, choosing an estimator and its hyperparameters. But if you want to think about choosing a pipeline, it's not going to be good enough. And the reason is that um, the dimensions are wrong. So, you, so you know, we have reason to expect that a squarish matrix should be low rank. But if you start um, adding on complexity of the models, right, and put you know, one pipeline as every column, you're going to get a very, very, very wide matrix. Okay. And since the row rank of a matrix is equal to the column rank, you can't estimate a more complex model per, um, per uh, column than you can estimate per row. Okay, So this is kind of problematic um, because it means that you know, even as we have a lot of sort of combinatorial interesting complexity um, in these pipelines, you know, we might need to, like if we wanted to really ex uh, understand that, we would need to, to sample a lot of parameters for every row. That means for every new data set. Okay. So the way we get around this is by using tensor structure to choose the best pipeline. So I'm going to explain to you how that works. Okay, so um, so let's imagine a, a simple example um, where uh, we've got um, pipelines that consist of preprocessors and estimators. Okay, so if I want to form an error tensor, I'm going to have data sets along one axis, um, the preprocessor I chose along another axis, and the estimator I chose along the third axis. And an element of that error tensor is going to be the prediction error of um, that pipeline using that estimator and that preprocessor on that data set. Okay. Um, I'm going to factor an error tensor like this um, 
into um, into a, I'm going to use the Tucker factorization. So the Tucker factorization is often graphically represented like this, involves a core matrix and three um, factor matrices. I'm not going to explain this in, in a lot of detail, um, but essentially uh, you should think of R1, R2, and R3 as a multilinear analog of the rank of a matrix. And the nice thing is you, you can choose a different rank for each of these dimensions. So I can have rank R1 for the data sets, I can have rank R2 for the preprocessors and I can have rank R3 for the estimator embeddings. Okay. Um, now, if I um, if I have a Tucker factorization like this, um, and I want to um, you know just estimate um, uh, a row of this matrix U, I only have R parameters to do this, um, and I can do that using the same in the same way that I would with matrix completion because I can sort of vec out um, the other the other dimensions of this tensor. Okay, this is called matricization of the tensor. Okay, so the way that you do experiment design is actually almost exactly the same. Okay, so the benefits of the tensor model, um, uh, you know, maybe one other one other uh, uh, aspect of this is that uh, when you start getting to really complex pipelines, you're probably not going to have time, even in meta training, to run every pipeline on every data set. So instead, you can do something like um, run only the pipelines that run fast enough. And um, impute the rest using tensor completion. Okay, and in meta test, um, you can run only R1 pipelines to estimate the embedding of a new data set. Okay, so this is nice because you can independently control the complexity with which you're modeling the data sets and the complexity with which you're modeling the pipelines and uh, uh, on which you ha might have more information. Okay, so how does meta training work? Um, we're going to collect some entries from the error tensor. So, for example, um, we collected prediction errors of pipelines that took less than 120 seconds to run. And we're going to impute the other entries with low rank tensor completion. Okay, so um, here's an example of an algorithm you can use to, to do this. Um, we call this EM Tucker. Um, it's a, a very simple algorithm that um, imputes um, missing entries, say with zeros, um, computes a Tucker factorization, and then uses the imputations from that, uh, the, the values from that factorization to re impute the missing entries and iterates until convergence. Okay, but there are lots of methods for uh, uh, tensor completion that could work here. Um, the important fact, um, right, and the thing that really allows our method to work um, is that this error tensor is approximately low rent multilinear rank. Um, so this model actually works well for imputation. So one way you can see this, and, and, and right, notice that the way that we selected entries is biased, right? We're not selecting entries uniformly at random. We're selecting ones that run fast enough. Okay, so let's imagine that we had a different cutoff. Let's imagine that, uh, right, we're going to say the training entries are going to be the um, uh, the error tensor entries that we could compute with runtime less than 90 seconds. Okay, so we're going to hold out the ones that took between 90 and 120 seconds to run. And we're going to ask if we um, fit a Tucker model that uses data set rank R1 and estimator rank um, R6, um, how well do we fit the entries of um, uh, of the tensor that we were looking at, that's the training, and how well do we fit the entries of the tensor that we held out, that's the test. Okay, so you can see that, and this is sort of um, I mean, this is sort of generally true, right? As you allow more and more parameters, your training error goes down and down and down. Okay, on the other hand, for the test set, right, for the held out entries, those so with a uh, uh, runtime between 90 and 120 seconds. As you increase the data set rank, it gets better and better for a while, and then it gets worse and worse. Okay. So the best data set rank actually is only around 20. So that means there's no real reason to run more than 20 experiments um, on your uh, new data set in order to pick a good uh, model on that data set. Anything more ends up overfitting. Okay. Um, so you can run the same kind of experiment for tensor oboe that we did for oboe. Um, we picked different runtime limits um, and we uh, tried out a bunch of different models. So Tensor Obo, um, AutoScikit Learn, um, Teapot, which is this uh, uh, genetic programming uh, method for choosing a, a, a pipeline, um, and the baseline pipeline, which was the pipeline that worked best on average across all the data sets that I told you about before. Okay, so you can see that all of these methods work substantially better than the baseline pipeline. Um, so they're uh, low, remember lower rankings are better. You want to be, be number one. 
Okay. Um, so you can see that tensor oboe performs the best at short times and is actually competitive with all of these um, substantially more complicated methods, um, even at long times. Okay. So there's something to this uh, low rank structure for automated machine learning. Um, okay. Uh, let me tell you about a different application of low rank structure in AutoML. Uh, that uh, uh, that uh, w w which is which is uh, relevant for for deep learning. Okay, so one uh, right. So deep learning has a bunch of different hyperparameters that really matter for the quality of fit. Uh, for example, the training time, the data set size, the architecture that you use, and the memory that you use in your GPU. And for many of these, it's pretty clear that bigger is better. Okay, so you'd like to have more training time, you'd like to have a larger data set size, you'd like to have an architecture with more parameters, so it's not entirely clear how to allocate those parameters. Um, and you'd certainly like to have as much GPU memory as you, as you can. But your budget is limited, right? And uh, the uh, cost um, and energy used by uh, deep learning models is, is large enough that it's getting um, to be a substantial um, environmental and monetary cost. So in this in this project, um, uh, which uh, was just posted on archive today, um, uh, well, I guess that'll be uh, two weeks ago for the people, uh, for those of you viewing this talk. Um, I, I, in this paper, um, we called uh, a Pareto estimation for picking the perfect precision. Okay, we um, showed how to use low rank models to choose the best precision um, for um, uh, for the for the the best precision, so floating point precision. Um, for the parameters of a neural net, the activation, and the optimizer, okay, given a memory budget. Okay, so given a memory budget, you know, you know how, you know, you know the total number of bits you're allowed to use, but you don't know how to allocate them between these things. Okay, so that's the question that we were considering. How should I allocate them? Okay, so let's, let's look at what a, a floating point precision is. Okay, so um, we can represent a floating point number um, using uh, the sign that takes one bit to say if it's positive or negative. And you can uh, you might use a, a certain number of bits for the exponent. So here I'm using three bits for the exponent and four bits for the mantissa. OK, so that allows me to represent a number, you know, in this form. OK, so, you know, depending on how many you know uh, bits I use for the exponent or the mantissa, um, I represent some numbers better and other numbers worse. Right. And I'm going to have, um, you know, I could have uh, underflow, overflow, um, uh, and uh, uh, sort of round off error. Okay. Um, if you use fewer bits, right, for every component of your deep learning model, then the total memory used is smaller. If you use more bits, the total memory used is larger. Okay. Um, and there are many different, um, you know, components of the model, right? So I talked about the um, uh, the weights used by the model the um, values used at each node, um, and um, also the, the values used inside the optimizer. Okay. So um, let's consider um, varying each of these parameters um, and looking at um, as a function of you know, which precision you use, which combination of precisions you use, how much memory does your, um, uh, does your uh, training take, and what test error are you able to achieve? Okay, so you can see that in general, as you use more memory, you're able to achieve lower test errors. But on the other hand, you can see that at any given memory, there are lots of configurations that produce worse test error than the best test error achievable at that memory level. Okay, so this motivated us to try to predict which points, right, which of these precision combinations is on the Pareto frontier, gives you the best test error for a given memory budget. Okay, so we're going to put in uh, blue the points that are non-dominated. That means they give you the best error for some memory budget. Okay, so our goal is to find blue circles, right? And then if you knew a memory budget, you would pick the blue circle that was the lowest, you know, but to the left of that memory budget. Okay, um, the best precision does depend on the data set. So um, across um, uh, 87 image data sets, we looked at the number of activation bits in all the non-daminated configurations for a range of different um, low precision configurations. And we found actually a significant diversity, okay? So um, sometimes you had five activation bits, sometimes six, sometimes seven, eight, nine, okay? It's not obvious how to choose this a priori. You need to know the memory budget and you need to know the data set. 
Um, so here's an example of what uh, uh, the training phase of this, this method might look like. You would collect a bunch of low precision configurations and a bunch of data sets. Okay? And you would run each of these low precision configurations on each of these data sets and compute um, the um, error uh, right, of the final model learned using this configuration on that data set. Okay? You might do the same thing in order to um, compute the memory of each um, configuration when run on each of these data sets. Okay. Now here's the idea of um, uh, Pareto estimation to pick the perfect precision. So given these meta-training data sets, you compute the configuration error of, um, uh, of each one, and, and you don't have to do all of them. You can leave some out, okay? Um, uh, and then you can use matrix factorization in order to compute a low-dimensional representation of each configuration. So I'm representing these with arrows. So these are like the YJs from the, um, the, uh, my explanation of OBO. Now, given a new meta-test data set, right? So this is a data set on which you want to find the best configuration efficiently. What we're going to do is select some of these configurations to evaluate. And of course, we're going to want to choose configurations that are cheap and easy to evaluate. Um, we're going to um, run each of those configurations on the new data set okay. um, and compute the error of that configuration on that data set. And then we're going to use linear regression against these estimated sort of configuration meta features um, to compute a new meta feature for this data set and use that to predict the configuration error of every configuration on this new um, meta test data set. Okay, simultaneously, we can compute the memory uh, of each of these configurations. And these two pieces of information together allow us to estimate which, um, right, the, the test error that we're likely to get for each memory, um, right, for every configuration. So each, each of these points is a configuration. We know its memory, we estimate its test error, and we can find the configuration that is estimated to have the best performance up to our me memory budget. Okay. So here's an illustration of what this looks like in practice. Um, we uh, meta-trained on 99 data sets in order to compute these um, uh, low dimensional embeddings for each configuration. Okay. Then we use experiment design with matrix factorization, the same thing I showed you in OBO, um, to find informative measurements. Right? So these are the orange squares. These are the configurations that we think were most useful to evaluate in order to understand our new data set. Okay. Um, we run these on, on our new data set, which here is actually uh, CIFAR, uh, CIFAR 10. Um, and we estimate um, uh, the test error of the other configurations um, using, um, using the results of these experiments that we run in orange. We restrict our attention to just the configurations that we estimate to be non-dominated. So those are the red X's. Now notice that not all of these red X's are actually non-dominated, right? For example, this one is dominated by this green plus, okay? So our method thinks that this is, you know, one of the best, right, for some memory budget, but it's not really, okay? And that's because we only did six experiments as opposed to, you know, if we did more and more experiments, um, you actually converge to um, finding the true non-dominated points. Um, finally, the, the configuration we select is the um, uh, estimated non-dominated configuration that uses the highest allowable memory. Okay, so that's, uh, you can see it right here, it's this blue square. Okay. So, um, I've shown you a bunch of ways of using structural models and particular low rank models to do automated machine learning. The advantage, there are a lot of advantages of these methods. One is that you can meta-learn from the task itself. There's no feature engineering required. Um, another advantage is that you can generate a sequence of more faithful models by increasing the rank, right? Or equivalently, you can generate a uh, decent model that's very, very fast by decreasing the rank. You can um, use these models to optimize efficiently in a high-dimensional discrete space using tensor structure. Um, and the linear structure makes it really easy to choose informative experiments, um, uh, obey budget constraints, and understand and optimize trade-offs. Okay, so I think all of these make a uh, low-rank structure a pretty powerful tool for many hyperparameter selection problems. Okay, um, but more generally, I'm interested in what other structural models can it promote efficient learning. So if you have ideas, I would be delighted to hear from you.
Um, thanks for listening. Um, uh, here are the references in particular. I'm going to call out the three main papers that I discussed. Um, uh, OBO, um, AutoML pipeline selection, um, which were both in KDD, and this paper on uh, 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 Pareto uh, estimation for picking the perfect precision, um, which was uh, uh, just posted on archive a couple of weeks ago. Okay, thank you. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Great, thank you so much for the talk. It was, uh, I think, I think one of the greatest explanations from start to end of the problem, but also I think that the the, the, the explanation of the low rank structure in these problems is, is really interesting and seems to be very effective. I'm a bit biased because I'm also a proponent of the low rank kind of uh, school of thought, um, but um, yeah, no, I think I think this was incredible and we got really interesting questions in the chat and also in the background. So I'm going to try and do my best to kind of squeeze as much uh, as many questions as possible in. Um, so one question that we got that was really interesting was, does the no free lunch theorem apply not only to individual estimators, but also to the whole automel meta algorithm? So the no free lunch theorem says that no algorithm is better than any other on average over all problems. So the only way that we can get around the low free lunch, no free lunch theorem is if the distribution of um, problems that we see is not uniform, right? The distribution of you know machine learning data sets is not uniform. Um, and uh, I, I think there, there are pretty strong reasons to believe that the, the, the set of all data sets that occur in the real world is not the same as the set of all possible data sets. Um, and this is really the key to allowing meta-learning to work. So, um, uh, uh, you know, if you want a really formal justification of this, actually, there's a beautiful paper um, by Christophe uh, Giraud-Carrier um, called Toward a Justification of Meta-Learning. Is the no free lunch theorem a showstopper? That actually proves something like this formally. So he states this um, uh, like a weak and a strong assumption of uh, machine learning where he says the weak assumption is that the set of learning problems uh, induces a non-uniform probability distribution over all possible functions that we might want to learn um, and uh, right so under this assumption meta learning is possible um, and, and i think you can see this even in the um I mean, so you can see, you know, different ways of mo of modeling and trying to understand and get at, right? What is this, uh, you know, non-uniform structure, of, you know, over the set of all possible um, problems? And different meta-learning methods are, um, you know, have different inductive biases over sort of, you know, what kinds of, right, what kinds of structures are possible? Um, you know, so so for example, you know, I guess in a worst case, you know, in a worst case universe, um, you might find that. You know this error matrix was not approximately low rank but that's not the universe that we live in right in in, in our universe this error matrix is is well you know it the, right the the spectrum of the um of the singular values of this matrix decay it is well approximated by low rank matrices and we can we can proceed right and there are lots of other structures that you can exploit here yeah no that that's that's very a very interesting point um i guess i'm going to extend the question a little bit just just uh, because i'm interested so you know we have we come up with models of these low rank matrices and uh, there are many possible models. Uh, there was a question I think I saw flash by you, you were really on top of things replying to all of them, but uh, there was I think a question on, on the linearity assumption. I guess could be plausible that some kind of an ensemble of meta algorithms could perform better than an individual algorithm um, kind of training us, you know, kind of bias, bias variance trade off in the context at the meta level as opposed to uh, for sure um you know i mean in general ensembles perform better than individual models um uh, and in fact even in nova this is something that i i i, I barely mentioned but um our, our final models that we propose are actually ensembles of some of the top models that we you know believe are going to be good mm -hmm. um uh, you know, in fact, I've heard uh, uh, Alex Smola um, from Amazon say that he thinks that hyperparameter search is just never a good idea because you should always build an ensemble instead of selecting a single best hyperparameter. You know, if you're going to go through the trouble of evaluating several hyperparameter configurations, the best model is going to be an ensemble of those. Um, and, and this holds probably even more true when you're considering different model types. 
um, you know, the, the, the major cost of, of, of ensembling is, of course, the um, complexity at test time. Exactly. Um, you have to evaluate all of these different models um, in order to output an answer. Yeah, no, that's that's a. I think I completely agree. You know, most of the models we recommend are ensemble in the end. Mm -hmm. um, mostly voting ensembles. When you go into stack ensembles, you need to kind of yes. hold out another set of data. It's like a whole thing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you can definitely win the Netflix challenge with the stack ensemble, but for the kind of size of data that you see in the world. Uh, you don't get as much. Um, yes, and your point about test time is, I think, the, the, the test time complexity of ensembles is completely right. I think actually uh, at AWS they actually develop stuff to compress ensembles. Yeah, 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 right. So, so once you, you right, so you, yeah, your, you know, your optimal pipeline is you, you do all this stuff, you, you make a big ensemble, and then you distill it, you know, distill into something, down. into something simpler. So, I, I, actually, the fact that distillation is possible um, is, I think, really, you know, interesting and maybe a little surprising. Um, right. In some ways, it's a, it's a, you know, even further there's a sort of vindication of like the possibility of learning, and it just says like we, we just need the right data to learn from. Um, exactly. Yeah, ex yeah. That's a whole. Uh, and if you, I don't know if you've seen a previous talk in the series. Lester Mackey gave like an awesome talk about yes. uh, distillation as some yes, parameter. Yes, yes. Anyway, um, uh, one more question on meta learning because I think it's it's it, it's kind of interesting. So. People several have asked me in the past, like, do we actually have, and I don't know if you've done it as part of your experiments, uh, do we actually have an experiment, uh, experiments on the performance of the system as you increase the amount of meta learning data? So as you kind of increase your training data mm -hmm. or decrease the missingness of the training data matrix? Mm. Um, we do actually have experiments on that in the Tensor OBO paper. We um, so we, uh, we we haven't done any experiments where we say let's let's suppose that you gather more and more and more data sets, but we've done experiments um, saying uh, you know suppose you've got this universe of all data sets and all algorithms. Suppose that you sample a higher and higher and higher fraction of the entries in the error matrix. Okay, so yeah. the missingness in the error matrix decreases and decreases. This allows you to get a better approximation of these learning components. Um, and um, so there we have, uh, I mean, you know, in fact, probably too many uh, <laughs> uh, plots showing, yes, performance uh, uh, it gets better as you evaluate more and more and more of the entries of the of the error matrix. But it, I mean, so, so it really, it's just exactly what you expect. It gets better and better, but it kind of saturates. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess I, I was curious about the column one. So adding data sets. I don't know if data sets ah, are columns or rows. Yeah, you, but. I, yeah. I, I mean, in some ways, like adding columns is even um, like it presents a, a you know more of an opportunity that you know if you if you add some columns that are cheap, um, like really cheap to um, sort of collect that data, right? Then you could actually find yourself um, um, you know with a, a easier problem to solve at test time when you go to try to understand a new data set, right? Maybe there's some really cheap. Um, models you could run on it that that give you you know the information that you want to know. Um, uh, I guess you also want yeah. I mean, it still can't. I, I want, like it still can't hurt you. And so you know, by the I mean the you know fitting a low rank model on this whole big thing, right? If you add more and more columns that are um, unrelated to the task at hand. Right, unrelated to the important task. So, say you're adding more and more columns that are, um, you know, not good machine learning models, but there are just some other random, you know, meta features that you've decided to put in. Um, that, I mean, if you use a sort of basic, uh, uh, you know, PCA or you know, lowering matrix completion um, to to fit that model, um, then you might end up sort of being pulled towards fitting those um, uh, those sort of unrelated meta features well, uh, and actually fit the rest of the um, matrix more poorly, which could make you perform worse at your task. Um, there are ways to mitigate. I mean, you could mitigate against that by sort of doing some kind of weighted, um, uh, weighted matrix completion. Um, but I haven't. I mean, we haven't explored that, and I haven't seen any um, any work on that. Yeah, no, that's 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 a very interesting thing. Uh, there is a whole. We have one minute left. I feel like I need to do my job and ask questions. Right? <laughs> uh, um, oh yes. So one question I saw in the background was why not use matrix vectorization? I'd, I'm I'm actually personally skipped that part. I, I missed that point. Uh, you're using for cost modeling. You're using like a polynomial model. So one question that I got, or yes. are you? Uh, um, so you're, why not use matrix factorization for both? Uh, because the, the question said factor of two uh, from true performance seems large when you have to kind of cut off things, cut things off from running. 
Um, so why not use the same meta model that you use for the performance? Yes. Okay. Also? So your question is why um, when you're trying to predict the runtime of each of these yes, exactly. um, models on each data set. Um, right now we're using a simple polynomial model. So the advantage of that is that you can um, estimate it using right like the the features that you need to compute in order to estimate it are trivial, right? Where they're just the number of samples and the right. number of features, right? Um, so you can predict how long it's going to take a model to run on the data set instantly. Um, yes. Uh, if you used a low rank model, um, then you'd on a when a, on a new data set, you'd have the same cold start problem, right? How do you predict on a new data set? You still need to figure out what's its low dimensional feature vector. Um, so you need to run at least k models on that data set before you can predict its low dimensional feature vector. So suddenly you're looking at um, a more expensive. Uh, yeah, and you don't know how much they will take, how long they will take. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends. You know, which of the, yeah, which of the models are, um, uh, you know. Do the do the models that best predict runtime run quickly, right? So right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which, which maybe they do, right? Maybe you can do a really simple PCA and a really simple, um, uh, uh, you know, decision tree, and then suddenly you can figure out how long all the rest are going to take to run. I, I, I mean, to me, like the the real problem with the runtime estimation is the fact that you can't capture the condition number of the matrix. Um, and are there easy ways? I don't think there are easy ways. I mean, there aren't easy ways to compute that. So I don't think. Um, I don't think a simple like I just don't think it's possible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Great. We are one minute over time. So in uh, thank you so much again for for the great talk and the great Q and A. Um, and as a reminder, your talk I think I think it's going to be available on YouTube. I'm not sure. Um, so thanks again for for presenting and thank you everybody else to for attending. Great. Thanks for thanks for your attention. Thanks for your questions. It's been fun to fun to be here.